Morning. So, here we go. This Sunday, uh, we kick off our new series, uh, Mythbusters. And where we will be uh, challenging some of the harmful myths found in popular Christianity. Over the, la- over the next four weeks, we'll be exploring biblical literalism, the Satan, and hell. And today, we will be looking at young earth creationism. Something to point out from the start is that, given the title of this series, you might think that myths are always a bad thing, and while for this series we'll be pointing out that the four myths we feel can have a negative impact on Christianity today, myths are not always, by definition, inherently problematic. For many Christians today, there is an assumption that these four myths of Satan, hell, biblical literalism, and young earth creationism are ancient and foundational to scripture and our faith. But that is not necessarily the case. We have chosen to look at these topics because we do a disservice to Scripture and to our faith when we continue to pass along outdated and unbiblical teachings that can have harmful and negative impacts impacts on Christianity and society. The reality is that the history of Christianity is varied and complex. From the writing and organization of Scripture to the historical decisions about creeds and doctrine, A quick survey of Christian history can reveal a number of positive additions over the centuries, new forms of prayer, worship, theological critiques and writings, music, and practices like communion and feet washing. These are, there are unfortunately also numerous examples of Christian practices that have not been positive, like the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and puppet ministries. I'm just kidding about puppets. I like puppets. (laughs) I do. I do like puppets. For many churches, these are sacred cows, and even being willing to have honest, open discussions about such topics is taboo. I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of a faith community that is willing to confront and wrestle with these things. But given the strong opinions surrounding these issues, we seek to be open for conversation and truly desire genuine spiritual growth. So I'll be kicking off this series on Young Earth Creationism, and it's probably good to start off by defining what we are talking about so we're all on the same page. Young Earth creationism is a belief that the world was created more or less in its current form around 6,000 years ago. It is believed that this creation event took place in a literal, six literal 24-hour days in accordance to the first chapters of Genesis. This belief system requires understanding Genesis as both a literal, historical, and accurate scientific account. Importantly, another significant part of young earth creationism necessarily requires the rejection of most scientifically accepted positions about the age of the earth from studies of geology, anthropology, and biology. Now, it's important for me to note from the start that believing in a young earth creationism is not the same as holding a foundational belief about God as the creator of the universe. It would be expected that Christians understand God as the creator But that does not require a belief that the world is only 6,000 years old. It is my hope that this morning we might be able to understand this distinction and be able to appreciate the amazing, elegant, and beautiful creativity of God without needing to accept a young earth creationist view of scripture. It is not my intention to arrogantly dismiss or belittle those who hold this belief. After all, I too once bought into these ideas through most of my teenage years. However, I do think it is important that we name the implications of holding such a belief system and debunk it as a required litmus test for Christianity. Some things that young earth creationists demand its adherents to believe are humans coexisted with dinosaurs and all other animals that are living today, Adam and Eve were the first and only humans when they had their children and that their children procreated with one another, The trusted practices in geology, archaeology, and radiocarbon dating are flawed or perhaps intentional hoaxes. The promotion of evolution and other scientific theories are wicked. The world was created around 4,000 years, or I'm sorry, the world was created around 4,000 BC, and that is calculated by adding up the genealogical information provided in Genesis 5. That chapter lists lists lifespans and ages for individuals when they had children. This includes the belief that the first descendants had incredibly long lifespans, seven, eight, nine hundred years. For those of you wondering, Methuselah was the oldest, living to the ripe old age of 969. Perhaps the most importantly, it is required to understand scripture as historically and scientifically flawless. 
So with that idea in mind, let's jump right into the text with the very first verses of the Bible. Um, I'm not going to have the scripture up on the screen. Instead, I'm going to read uh, from Genesis 1, um, and this is a long section, so I'm only going to be reading verses 1 to 8 and then skipping ahead to 24, uh, but I think you'll get the idea, and, and most of us are familiar with this passage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made a vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning on the second day. Skipping ahead. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock and creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit and seed in it. This will be yours for food. And to the beasts of the earth and to the, all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And, and it was so. God saw what he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It's beautiful. It really is. This creation story speaks to the creative powers of God. There is strong language and bold imagery. These verses speak to the strength and the might of God who speaks things into existence and does so in an orderly and formulaic way. This presents God as a kingly ruler able to decree the world into existence bringing order from chaos. But where did this version of the story come from? Who wrote this down? And what's the explanation? Why? This is where we can start to see how young earth creationists arrive at their understanding and where biblical literalism plays a key role. Now in two weeks, we will hear from Pastor Pam more in depth about this topic. However, there is no way to understand young earth creationism without knowing that this is rooted in biblical, biblical literalism, which in this case means an unwavering belief that Moses himself wrote the book of Genesis along with the rest of what we refer to as the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Under the direct guidance of God, uh, Moses had set out to write these books. Young earth creationists therefore believe that Moses is communicating a literal description directly from God about how the earth was created. Most biblical scholars generally agree that Moses did not write the Pentateuch. There are some obvious concerns, like if Moses was the author, how did he write about his own death in Deuteronomy? But the most convincing evidence generally comes from textual analysis and source criticism, which carefully evaluates the Hebrew text, examining the word choice and syntax. This tedious process has led many biblical scholars to accept a documentary hypothesis for Genesis and other books that are included in the Pentateuch. Without going into too much detail, uh, instead of these being written by a single author, Moses, it was most likely a combination of four distinct sources, with themselves have being informed by multiple voices and traditions. It is worth pausing here to note that just because Moses may not have written and been the author of Genesis, this should not minimize the value and the authority of these scriptures have in our lives. 
Digging into these texts to discover information about the history and authorship only adds to the value and context of Scripture. It is out of the deep appreciation of Scripture that these concepts are taken so seriously. A plain, literal reading of of Genesis that relies on the lore of Mosaic authorship does not serve a people seeking to better understand the Bible. So now let's turn back to Scripture. The popular passage that we read in Genesis 1 is believed to have come from a source which was likely written in, uh, during the time of Jewish leaders were in exile in Babylon. You likely notice that this first creation story did not contain anything about Adam and Eve, a serpent, or forbidden fruit. That is because those are part of a second creation story found in the next chapter. And let's take a look at that. I'm going to read again from this scripture starting at Genesis 2-4, reading up to verse 8, and then skipping ahead to verse 18. This is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. The streams came up from the earth, and the watered the whole surface of the ground. When the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. There he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So that the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed it in place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and becomes one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This account is different from the first reading. Stylistically, it is more narrative than the poetic repetition that we saw in chapter 1. Organizationally, it describes creation in a different order. Instead of plants on day three, animals on day five, and humans, humans on day six, Genesis mentions humans first, then plants, then animals for Adam to name. This creation story in chapter two is most likely from an earlier source, which originated during the Jewish monarchies before the Babylonian exile. The source also consistently uses different name for God than chapter one, while Genesis one, Elohim, is used for God in the second account starting at chapter two, a compound YHWH, or Yahweh Elohim, is used. So if these two chapters in Genesis were intended to be a clear historical and scientific account, why are there two different stories? The simplest and most important answer to that question, and perhaps one of the most important things to take away from this morning, is that these verses were never written with the intent of being understood as literal, historical, and scientific accounts. It's difficult for us to accept that answer because humans living in the Western culture, after enlightenment and scientific revolution, we put a premium on and authoritative value on scientific and historical accuracy. We forget the world did not always operate in this way. For most of history, capital T truth was explained through allegory, metaphor, not verified data, or sto- and storytelling and song, not primary accounts of history. We are imposing and seeking a contemporary standard for an ancient text. Using modern insight and seeking to contemporary, I'm sorry, using modern insight, metrics, and science to discover truths about the past is different than expecting our ancestors operated in the same way in their own time. New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan says it this way, My point is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but they told them symbolically, and we are now foolish enough to try and take them literally. 
While it's true that people over the centuries have used the genealogies of the Bible to calculate the earth's creation to around 4000 BC, there have also been important Christian thinkers like Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, Augustine in the 5th, and Origen in the 3rd, who all held an allegorical reading of Genesis, not a literal, historical, scientific one. So if you're wondering to yourself, well, which one of these two creation accounts is actually more accurate, more historical, or scientifically correct, then you're missing the point entirely. It's important to understand that the authors that we might, that we might call history throughout most of historians, throughout most of the Old Testament scripture, are not historians by modern sense of the word, but storytellers who are looking to their past traditions to say something not only about their past, but also about their present. These first chapters of Genesis are loaded with symbolism, and it would take literally many, many, many sermons for us to even scratch the surface. There are likely symbolic references that are throwing shade on popular Babylonian creation accounts like the Enuma Elish, creative references to wind and breath, Adam being formed from the earth, and taking the same name as the word for earth. Not to mention the whole story of the serpent and the trees of knowledge and evil. These creation accounts are not only stories about creation, but a prologue for the book of Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament. The story of creation is simultaneously an origin story for the earth and a story of us as a people. There are symbolic threads that echo the evolution and anthropology of humanity, a loss of innocence as humans wear clothing and become more knowledgeable, less like animals, more like humans, Cain ultimately advancing to civilization after killing his brother, surpassing Abel's prehistoric hunter-gatherer lifestyle with his own life of agriculture. When we only read the text for its literalism, we miss the rich and valuable symbolism. But this is not the only loss that comes with young earth creationism. Generations of children are being taught to fundamentally, fundamentally distrust empirical evidence. Despite many people finding the idea of humans riding dinosaurs comical, this is not at all a small, flat earth type of fringe group. Young earth creationism is embraced by millions. Answers in Genesis, probably the most prominent leader of this mo movement, operates the Creation Museum as well as the Ark Encounter, a life-size replica of Noah's Ark, which does include dinosaurs alongside animals inside. It is also a multi-million dollar organization, a media producer and overall influencer in this movement. They have recently celebrated their 25th anniversary and have grown to around 1,000 staff members. Their adult Sunday school curriculum has been used in over 10,000 congregations, and their VBS curriculum is very popular, one of the top three sold in the world. I only mention this success to show that these are not fringe ideas, but are held and circulated widely amongst Christianity. Despite the success of groups like Answers in Genesis, polling has revealed that fewer people today hold these views than in the past. Still, according to a 2017 Gallup poll, 38%, which is more than one in three Americans, believe that God created humans in present form within the last 10,000 years. That number increases by 65%, nearly two out of three for weekly churchgoers. This movement has remained powerful because it has positioned itself as the only correct way to understand scripture, that anything else represents a failure of faith, Smart adults are able to disregard otherwise credible information because such evidence has been associated with evil. It is black or white. You either believe in God or you must accept young earth creationism or you believe in evolution and science and are therefore aligning yourself with atheism. That is an unfair ultimatum. I feel the need to state unequivocally that in this congregation you can be a faithful Christian, a lover of scripture, and a devoted follower of Jesus, and still believe in empirical science. You will never be asked to check your brain at the door before becoming a part of this church. Loving God and trusting evidence-based science do not need to be mutually exclusive. If it is true, it is of God. The reason that I feel it is so important for me to say that this morning is because it has not always been my experience with church. This issue for me is a personal one, this issue, more than any other, is what almost caused me to walk away from my faith when I was younger. Growing up, I largely accepted much of what was taught to me in church, including creationism as a child and young teen. 
But I remember when I was older and we had a lesson in Sunday school about the debate between evolution and creation. In this lesson, it was made clear to me that evolution was a hoax. And any failure of mine to not believe in a literal creation account reflected a lack of faith. And this was heavy. It was much tougher than I would have thought. I knew I could not accept such beliefs in the face of such obvious and overwhelming evidence. So what to do? I was frustrated and I felt that I was being lied to, which only made me start to question other things about my faith. What other lies were being told? What other shoe was going to drop? If I did not have a supportive family and other Christian friends who believed in evolution, I may have just walked away. Fortunately, I was able to grow in my faith in some more supportive communities like camp and when I was in college at Laverne. I share this because I know how confusing it can feel to have something you believe in just disappear. It can feel like the floor drops out from under you. Fortunately for me, my understanding of God and Jesus was deeper, was not wrapped up only in fundamentalism and biblical literalism. There are, however, many people whose faith is built like a house of cards that requires constant and vigilant protection. I have often heard it said, well, if you don't believe in, fill in the blank, then, then you might as well just throw out your entire faith because you can't trust any of it. For many young earth creationists, they passionately defend their beliefs, ignoring or dismissing mounting scientific evidence, performing mental gymnastics and con contorting facts because the alternative risks pulling out a card that might cause their entire house of faith to fall apart. In this way, I can be sympathetic to their position, maybe even respect their fortitude. Not only must it be exhausting to constantly hold this type of apologetic posture, but it's unnecessary. Young Earth creationists don't only carry an unnecessary burden of having to build their reality around a literal reading of Genesis, but may not fully appreciate the benefit that comes with reading these accounts symbolically. I believe in God as creator and can willingly admit that there remains a lot of mystery and confusion with how the universe came to be. But I'm okay with that. I am not God and could never possibly fathom the complexities of time, space, and physics that have brought about this reality that we share today. I have no desire to cram God into a box with black and white lines so that I can be satisfied with my comprehension of the divine. I do not seek to domesticate God in order to fit a specific reading of scripture. It is incredibly liberating and inspiring to worship a creator that is mysterious, that cannot be confined, and provides questions to answers that is bigger, greater, and more beautiful than I can comprehend. The complexity of a universe unfurling itself over billions of years, growing, adapting, evolving, and changing is much more inspirational and impressive than a God who snapped his male fingers 6,000 years ago to create what we have today. So today, as you contemplate the wonder of creation, remember that perhaps one of the most important and significant things is not about how exactly it happened, but that it happened at all. There was no guarantee that existence was to happen, no promise of life, no assurance that earth was, or even this universe was supposed to exist. The very act of creation, the very opportunity to be, is a gift. We have all found ourselves here this morning in a place, in this place, at this time. How beautiful that is, and how wonderful it is that we can go from this place into creation and appreciate that it was created and that it was called very good. <laughs>